Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. Everybody, welcome back to Word Balloon. If you enjoy the videos here, please consider liking the video, subscribing to the Word Balloon YouTube channel, and uh, of course, if you enjoy the audios and the videos, you can subscribe to my Patreon page, patreon.com slash Word Balloon. Welcome back, Gail Simone. It is great to see you. We were just saying that uh, oh, we, we were at the last con standing, uh, C2E2. That's the last time I saw yeah, you. Yeah, I know. Memories, right? <laughs> Distant memories. Isn't it weird? I mean, obviously, I mean, let's state the obvious. Isn't it weird? It's very weird. I mean, I am literally probably in one of the best places you could ever be for this situation. We ha we um, Scott's parents left us their house on a lake, which is very run down. So a lot of work needs to be done. We've been spending time clearing brush and, and all that. But we're pretty isolated and it's a great place to write. And, um, you know, we are outside of a small town. So going in, as long as you have your mask on and are, you know, relatively careful and use hand sanitizer, I don't think we could be better off. And we're all kind of living here as a contained unit. And, um, you know, I miss my sister and, you know, my mother and, and people like that that I can't go see because my whole family is compromised in oh, terms yeah. of their immunity, you know, so. Yeah. Um, but we are just have to do this the best we can and try to keep people, everyone as safe as we can do our part. hundred percent, buddy. No, I'm with you. It's weird. So is your son with you too? Yeah, okay. he is. He had just moved kind of back in with us part time when this was starting to go on. So then we just said, Hey, just stay here. We'll all be safe. And, and, uh, you know, he can help by proofreading and doing some light editing for me and, you know, Cool. Help, help clear brush. Use his muscles. <laughs> Absolutely. I understand. That's awesome. Um, well, let's, you know, Gail, unfortunately, it's been an ugly time in comics. and um, But in obviously some ways this is positive because it points out that you never solve this problem and bad behavior uh, gets made public. And thankfully, bad people who are abusing um, younger creators or wannabe creators uh, – traumatizing them, uh, abusing them physically, sexually, sometimes it's, it's terrible. And I'm, you know, I mean, it's like I said, it's an ugly, complicated thing. Um, I know that you've been a, a very strong advocate, obviously the change needs to happen. And I wanted to just, yeah, no, you know, any, any suggestions or what's going on in your mind as this shit happens, unfortunately. Well, it's, it's just, you know, devastating. You take something that, you know, for most of us, it meant so much to us in our childhoods. And then we became blessed in terms of being able to work in the industry in one way or another and, um, you know, manage to, make, you know, work our dream job and to learn. And, of course, you know, I've been hearing about this for a long time. This is not new stuff. There are new um, people coming forward, there are more people coming forward, and that's great because now you can't ignore it anymore. Absolutely. Which, um, you know, a lot of it has been ignored for a long time. But I um, just feel horrible that predators have become so good at weaponizing someone's dreams. And that's what we have to get in and, you know, block. So um, I feel like the way forward, we need paths forward. We need paths for the companies to um, be able to listen and take appropriate action when people do come forward. Because uh, I don't want the whole industry to burn down. No. Whether it, you know, so some people, I don't care if they burn down, but I'm I don't want the industry to burn down because there are a lot of great people in this industry. And I, and so you know, what I'm trying to think of is solutions and I'm not an expert and I don't have all the answers, but I want there to be paths for the companies and paths for creators. And by that, I mean, you know, we, creators that come forward need to be listened to, appropriate action needs to be taken. We need to have safe ways into the industry. Um, there sh you shouldn't have to do a job interview in a late night bar 
with right. one person. You know, you shouldn't have to go to someone's hotel room to have a portfolio review. Yeah. Uh, these things just, um, I think we need to somehow make it known that if that is what's being proposed, that you need to run the other way. You know, uh, an editor or whoever can do a portfolio review on a con floor or, you know, in a conference room with other people there I mean, it, waiting to have reviews. It's just this one-on-one -on -one stuff is just not safe at this point. I mean, I know there have been these things happen that have been safe, but it's just not, you know, companies shouldn't be run that way. Um, and I think that because I brought up all along that you shouldn't have to do a job interview in a bar. You shouldn't have to be have to go out and be in a bar in order to get jobs. I, you know, I don't, people can drink all they want. They can socialize. All that's fine. I'm not against that. I'm not trying to judge anybody. Um, but like there are people who don't drink who work in the industry and should be able to, you know, get jobs without having to um, jump over those hoops. So I think, you know, there just needs to be pathways for everybody that's safe. And we have to figure out what that's going to look like. And, um, you know, I don't have the perfect answers yet, but no. we can't ignore it. Ignoring it is not working. It's not safe. It's not morally right to do. And I hear a lot of talk about from groups saying that there's been, that there's this huge uh, whisper network of women that are trying to monitor all the dudes behavior and stuff. Well, you know what? If we fucking had that all along, maybe we could have prevented some of this. This is they are way exaggerating what's going on. And if if, um, you know, and I don't want to monitor dudes behavior unless it's criminal and unless it's, you know, to the level that we're hearing about. Then, yeah, but you deserve to be called out on it and people need to have a safe way to talk about it. So, you know, I'm calling kind of bullshit on that. And um and safe places for people to talk because like people have come to me before, you know, almost all along because they're so f at, a, at a time, not, not so recently, but at a time there wasn't that many freelancers, female freelancers that had power and they would come to me and tell me a story and then swear me to secrecy. So you feel like it's not your story to tell. And then what can you do about the problem from that point? But you cannot have, an industry where um, an employee of a company can terrorize an entire staff or an, a, an employee can be protected to the point that certain genders can't write characters because that person's working on that character. This is not professional. This is not grown up behavior. This is, th these are things that just can't continue. It's, you know, I don't know how to stop a predator from weaponizing someone's dreams, but we need to have safe ways in the industry. And for example, when quarantine first happened, I was just like in shock, like, what do we do? I couldn't really concentrate to write. So I decided to do a five day um, writing class on Twitter, comic school. Mm -hmm. And I thought maybe 50 people might join along, you know, and it would be kind of fun and a good distraction and something positive yeah. to focus on rather than the world collapsing, basically. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, I thought 50 people and we got thousands and thousands. And now a young black woman just closed her first Kickstarter. It closed at $80,000. She's going to produce her own comic. And she That's attended great. that comic school. And, you know, I'm so proud of her. And there's lots of other stories like that that are coming out of that. So, you know, that seemed to be a positive thing and a positive way for somebody to get in. But, you know, we have to be able to work at the larger companies too safely, the, everyone. And I'm not talking about just dudes, John. I hear stories from people where there are women in power who are guilty of um, this type of behavior as well. So everyone just needs to, um, you know, respect other people and not weaponize people's dreams. It's just... Yeah, really horrifying and so basic in terms of just professional good behavior. And what disappoints me, Gail, is the fact that accusations have been happening in the last 20 years and certainly mm -hmm. the last 15 that I've been doing the podcast. And given that both major publishers, the big two, are owned by bigger conglomerates, how isn't there any sort of and maybe there is and these assholes just ignore it any sort of uh, orientation for, hey, don't, you know, don't 
abuse other workers. Watch what you say. Behave in a professional manner. I mean, my God, it started in the 90s in broadcasting, at least my own point of view from my companies that I worked at. But yeah, man, it was drummed in all the time. And certainly in the 2000s and in the Me Too era and stuff like that, thankfully, it's gotten even more strict as well it should. And and it's like, no, you can't do that. You know, what passed as casual conversation, hey, you got to watch your ass. And it's like, <laughs> don't offend, really? I mean, well, again, you just don't know and you don't want to be offensive. It's that. It's right. that well, just respect you know. other people's boundaries. Come on. But I want to say something real quick about HR departments. Please. Because my experience with HR departments, because a lot of people are like, we need HR departments to go to to tell this stuff to, which, yeah, we do. But the problem in my experience is HR departments work for the company. Right. And so they are going to go into, I'm going to protect the company mode, and they're not really there to help you. Um, we have people in the industry that have very large HR files <laughs> that are still working in the industry. So, um, wow. That's not the answer, in my opinion. Wow. Because um, unless they completely reform them. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I mean, I, I understand. hear about, you know, let's have groups, let's have better HR departments, all that. It, that has not worked. Um, okay. In my opinion, I so we have to figure out how to either reform that or do something separate or whatever. And then also, I'd like to propose the thought of: Do we really need um, open bars with unlimited amounts of drinks at conventions? You know, is that something that is acceptable now? I mean, a lot of people can handle their liquor just fine, but a lot of people can't. Can't. And a few yeah. drinks is okay, but when we're drinking all night long and then, you know, taking somebody vulnerable back to a hotel room or whatever, is that what we want the industry to do? And when I brought this up before, I've been told, oh, well, everyone's just blowing off steam, which is, you know, I do understand that because we all work in an isolated way, basically. I mean, I'm talking about artists and, and unless you're part of a studio like me, I'm completely isolated. And so you go to a convention, you're catching up with everybody, you're yeah. getting your social time in. It's great. And having fun and partying and whatever, all of that's awesome. But do we really want to make it easy for somebody to, you know, go too far? I understand the question. I I hope that step isn't necessary because, uh, again, I, I think uh, – you know, yeah, because it's just it, it. It's a shame that all of us responsible people can't just hang out. And I mean, yeah, you know, no. I mean, and obviously people and, do. and you should be able to. People should be able to. Um, you know, maybe now that more people are aware of the situation, maybe more people will keep an eye out instead of turning a blind eye. I don't know, but I just know that HR departments reporting it hasn't worked. It has destroyed careers to the point where then when things do happen, people don't want to report, and so. Yeah. People like Joe Harris and Shauna Gore, who were so brave and came forward with their stories, and it was so had to be just so difficult for them, but they knew it needed to happen, and because of them, they may, you know, they will likely save other people this type of heartache, and so I respect them completely. I'm in their corner forever, uh, so thank you to them and and the others who have done the same. Yeah, no, and and uh, I mean, I know people that had issues happen to them years ago. Um, Taki Soma has been very public with what happened to her. Mm -hmm. I remember that incident. A lot of times they're yeah. not calling it wrong and saying it happened in one city. And it's like, no, it was in the city I was in. And I remember the weekend. <laughs> it happened. And it's truly, yeah, we I all, remember that too. Yeah, yeah. We were all mortified and it's like, what do you want us to do? And, and I understand because again, she was being a nice person and being like, all right, you know, whatever, and you know, had to had to minimize it, and then again for Brownstein to be able to continue, uh, it's and and really just everything that was happening behind the scenes at uh, CBLDF is just it 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 negates the good stuff that they were doing in a lot of ways, and that's exactly, really and that is the the tragedy of it. And also, yeah. I want to say this: if if someone is um, if there's one incident, probably not the only one. OK, right. Most predators are in learning mode and, um, you know, and escalating mode. So, um, yeah, getting this out early is really, I think, important, if at all possible. I agree. All right. Let's now slightly less 
um, you know, uh, hot button. But I am interested because I saw you kind of spitballing on on Twitter. First of all, you know, I, I constantly follow, and you always have fun topics. But every now and then, you get a little, you know, interesting and serious. And the whole cancel culture thing is really problematic. And I get the initial understanding of, hey, this you know person was an asshole, really rude, was racist, was homophobic go down uh, the terrible behavior list. And it's like, no, I'm with you. But I, but I do struggle with that same question of God, do, does the, does the, does the art disappear? Can you, and you even made the point yourself, can we separate the art from the artist? Cause God damn, you know, the history of uh, Hollywood. We oh, may have yeah. literally erase a hundred years of filmmaking. Yeah, I know. Um, and as I said, I don't think erasing is the, the right thing to do. And we all have choices. We all have our choices, whether to support something that's currently happening that we know about, whether where to put our dollars, uh, you know, to, to support certain types of work and not support others. And, and we all have that freedom. Mm-hmm. And I encourage everyone to exercise that freedom. But, um, you know, and, and if I find out someone like I feel I was having this talk about J.K. Rowling for one thing. Um, and so many people, her work saved their lives. I mean, they loved it. It taught them some people how to be themselves. There's so many good things about it. It got people reading that weren't reading old generations. You know, this is an amazing, good effect of that, but man, you know, how do you, how do you move forward from that, um, now with her future work and things? So those are all personal decisions that people should you know, make for themselves on how they feel in their heart, you know, what they think is the best thing to do. Um, you know, I, I'm always going to, I don't, I'm against hate groups, hate speech, all of that stuff, but I'm for freedom of speech. And when nowadays when we're seeing that disappearing little by little, it's very scary. I'm very worried about that. So I do think that people have the right to have free speech as long as it's not hate speech. And, um, and, you know, we can't, we want freedom to believe the way we want to believe. So we can't, you know, force our beliefs on other people. Uh, you know, I'm against that too. So yeah. it's tough. No, I, yeah, I, I was a huge fan of Cerebus, huge fan. And that's really tough for me. And when I go back and read it now, I can see things that I didn't see the first wow. time <laughs> through. Wow that are kind of scary, you know, but at the time, you know, it was a, a, a brilliant piece of work that I really, really love. And, you know, it hurts. It hurts to find that out. Understood. No, I appreciate you talking about this, Gail, because, yeah, honestly, uh, I know a lot of people do come to you for your your thoughts on these subjects. So, so really, I thank you. Well, um, and I'm a huge fan of H.P. Lovecraft, too. And, you know, you, you can't oh, deny his he's problematic as a human, you know? And so, and you were saying um, Robert Howard too. Yeah. And, and yeah. in some ways, like my experience, this is something kind of a little bit of a tangent, but when I was asked to write Red Sonia, I said, no. And you've probably heard that story before. I just, in my mind, Red Sonia was a crappy eighties movie that I didn't like, or an airbrushed, you know, woman in a chain mail bikini on the side of a stoner van. It just did not, appeal to me. I didn't know what I had to offer that. Um, but my mom, who's also a redhead, when I mentioned, oh, I just got asked to write Red Sonia, she's like, well, you're going to do it, right? And I'm like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> she goes, oh, you have to. I love Red Sonia. Please do it for me. And she literally, you know, text and called for two weeks until I was like, okay, I agreed to do six issues. Um, and then I realized in researching and sitting down to write her that, you know, there were a lot of feminist ideas then you know he really had some great characters and ideas and um so i would go with that part of it rather than the part that um, didn't age so well but now she's one of my favorite licensed characters to write i just really love the rawness of her and so thanks mom for bullying me into writing red sonia <laughs> i'm still i'm working on the red sonia film and i'm still hey, doing awesome. other <laughs> still doing other red sonia product projects so there we go. <laughs> That's amazing. I didn't know your mom was, uh, you know, a nerd. That's fantastic. I didn't know she was a Red Sonia fan. That was completely new to me. I was shocked. I was like, what? Why do you like her? But, you know, she was a kick-ass 
redheaded female, kind of like how I identified with Barbara Gordon sure. um, to my mom. And so I was like, okay, I can see that now. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, that's fantastic. That's amazing. Well, and you know, um, well, first of all, with Robert Howard, I feel the same way. I love foreign intrigue just because of the idea of globetrotting and, you know, these, oh. these moments of culture. And unfortunately, again, because of the era, very problematic. I mean, yeah. like Sailor, Sailor Costigan is my favorite Robert Howard character because I'm a, you know, I'm a boxing fan. Yeah. And I love the <laughs> idea of this merchant mariner just kind of going from port to port, fighting all these different people and stuff. I'm like, that's really cool. Yeah, but again, you read them, you read them, and it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just the adventure part of these stories is what's so appealing. And yes. myself growing up on an isolated farm, you know, outside of a really tiny town, books and reading is what took me out of my, you know, dysfunctional yeah. family and chores on the farm, and you know, and I always dreamed of traveling, never thought it would happen. And, uh, you know, that's been the best thing, you know, besides the people I've met, that's been the best thing about this career for me is that I was able to travel a lot and, and gain a lot of knowledge that could not be taught in school. You know, um, I felt so blessed for that. Completely different than being behind a hairdressing chair all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask, uh, during, I'm surprised you were saying, uh, you know, first of all, your hair looks great. But I was, was going to ask, did uh, did you cut anybody's hair during the during the pandemic? I haven't yet, but Scott's next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we're social distancing, I'm not really, you know, we have a bathroom that's half finished that we haven't even let the person come in to finish during this. So we've been just super careful. Okay. Um, are you going to, yeah. with your bathroom, are you going to trick it out so that you can cut in there and everything? If you know, Oh, no. Okay. I'm retired from hair, except for, okay. you know, close, close family. <laughs> That's awesome. That's fantastic. I, uh, well, and, 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 and it's interesting because um, I, let's swing this to your work. I, I, Domino, you know, and I know I wrapped up last year and everything, but I was rereading that. It was great, but I loved like you walk and he actually, even in previous books of yours as well, you know, you're not afraid of sexuality and making things, you know, eye, eye catching. And I'm again, again, a lot of those might be the choices of the artist. But like Domino, that was awesome. I mean, men and women looked fantastic, and you had hookups, and you know, it was it was fun. So you know, I mean, that's cool that it's you know, it can, well, I'm, you know what I mean. I mean, there's just that line, I guess, or tightrope of you know, doing things cool but not objectifying. Right. Well, humanizing, I think, okay. is is probably the best word maybe to use be, rather than objectifying and, and making people a participant in what's going on. Because, you know, first of all, this is a visual medium and we need lots of variety in how things look um, and the tones and all of that. And then also, um, you know, sex is a part of life and part of the adventure of life. And, you know, yeah. it also you know, tells a lot about character on how they are sexually. So I, you know, I've never shied away from that. I was always just like, okay, let's do, we need some more beefcake if we're going to have the cheesecake, <laughs> you know, but I don't, what I don't like is things that are thoughtless. I don't like things that are just obvious, um, you know, pet house type porn poses uh, and things like that, that don't really tell a story. You know, I like it to be character specific and and interesting and and and, and surprising. To me, that's what's what makes things sexy is kind of having that surprise and and not just being the same unpredict same predictable thing over and over. So yeah, and these characters have vibrant lives, even though they're fiction, and that's part of it. That's cool. I want to reach back because I just talked to Nicola Scott a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about your Birds of Prey run, and really out of, off the top of my head. One of my favorite scenes, and she drew it, you wrote it, was uh, well. First of all, the whole Bane scandal relationship, <laughs> and and really this like, I guess you know, kind of samurai attitude on Bane's part, and it's like he just really protected her. And that great moment when he was strung out on Venom, and she really had to take care of him. And it really was this really beautiful scene of two people. Like she didn't want Bane's love. 
but they did have that love. And and I'm curious to, ha- to hear how you would characterize their relationship and that scene. Right. Okay. So first of all, um, having Nicola as the artist during that um, storyline was absolutely a blessing. And, you know, I couldn't have asked for someone better to do that because the thing about her is that, you know, when I'm writing a script, there are things that I will want on a panel and there might be, let's just use round numbers. There might be 10 things that I really, you know, would be cool on the panel. I hope that five make it in. I'll be happy if these two that I state are super important that have to go in are there. Um, and, and with Nicola, her ability to draw something brutal and tender and sexy y'all at the same time is not something that comes easily to a lot of artists. She has a special gift with being able to get those emotional character acting um, visually across on the page. And, um, you know, without an artist of that quality with that ability, I'm not sure that those scenes would have worked nearly as well, um, just because that requires such a particular skill. Um, I just thought, you know, when I was at, I, Bane is one of the characters that I was actually asked to put into Secret Six. And that's another character that I was like, oh, Bane, he's just a big old bulky Venom dude who, you know, addicted to Venom, who broke Batman's back. I don't care. You know, kind of attitude. And so, um, and so sitting down and trying to figure out how to, how I would feel comfortable writing him for one thing and how he would fit into the Secret Six and work as a character among them, um, you know, took a bit of thought. And I really started thinking about, you know, wouldn't it be more interesting if, you know, him and Scandal had a father-daughter type relationship, okay. even if it was reluctant. And and then just the idea went from there. And then to, to tell this story with some pieces of humor, with some tenderness, with some, you know, fear, all of that, I think um, was something that I felt like, interesting story that would that was meaningful to me that might mean something to other people that would add something to Bane's character other than just being kind of one-dimensional and I that's the thing I love to do with these licensed characters is to take them and and create something that's modern and different and adds those layers to you know not to take away but to add the layers and Bane is one of those characters that um, ended up being something that I, that was kind of like a, a purse that became a gift, you know, and, and they used that take on Bane in the film. So, um, you know, it must've resonated with other people as well. Absolutely. And again, this is how art hits the public. I mean, I, like I said, I kind of saw more as an unrequited love rather than a father daughter. Nicola described it the same way you did in terms yeah, of father daughter. Yeah. And, and, and again, but just that whole scandal is such a great character. Seriously. Well, oh, no, I miss writing scandal a lot. Um, and I think that the DCU needs a character like that. Absolutely. My God, yes. I mean, and and really, yeah. I mean, because, again, sometimes legacy characters like, hey, it's Vandal Savage's daughter. Yeah, all right. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, you really – you gave her this great complexity. And, yeah, again, it was um, – yeah, I, I just I, – I, well, I fell in love with all the Secret Six and uh, was cracking up uh, looking at Naked Catman, or at least you know, three-quarters <laughs> Naked Catman, at least. Um, no, you no, should no. have heard those conversations with DC um, in the beginning, because oh. that started with, um, I was asked to write a villain, the Villains United book for the crossover that was happening at the time, because yes, they had noticed that they liked the way that I was writing villains at the time. So, yay! Um, but then I started asking for villains and I was asking for the Joker and Penguin and Lex Luthor and I just, they wouldn't, I couldn't use any of them. And so I kind of describe this as if you're sitting in a circle in a classroom around a table and the teacher comes in and dumps a big pile of crayons in the middle and everybody reaches for a crayon and, you know, you've got a frog you want to color and the green is gone. So now you're going to have a purple frog. And that's kind of what what Secret Six became, what Villains United became was, you know, taking this big box of crayons and trying to make something different and unique that hadn't been done before um, out of, you know, scraps basically, or out of whatever was left. And, you know, like I was too slow to get the right crayons. So I had to, you know, 
do my best with what was left. And so I finally, that led me to asking for Catman because I thought, you know, DC doesn't really have a really cool hunter tracker character. Um, so uh, maybe we can take something like Catman, send him to Africa, you know, get him to change his physique, change his attitude, be a little more wild and come back. And I was describing this to DC and they're like, whatever, Gail. <laughs> and then <laughs> finally, and I'm like, no, it'll be really sexy and it'll be cool. And it'll be like the Wolverine of the DCU and they're like, whatever, Gail. And um, then when Dale drew that first um, design of the new Catman yeah. and sent it to DC, DC was like, Oh, we get it now, you know, because it was just so, it said so much and was so sexy and sure. charismatic and work. And so I was like, okay, <laughs> that, that's when I learned that I liked doing that thing. I liked doing the unexpected with the characters. That's outstanding. Well, and I loved in Domino, uh, the Shang-Chi Domino. <laughs> that was that was, that was so much fun. Oh my gosh. And you know, the Domino art team and as well as the editor on that book, um, I have to say that, you know, they asked me, they, Marvel had asked me many times throughout the years if I was interested in, in doing a book. Like they'd call and say, you know, how about She-Hulk? She-Hulk's going to become available. I'm like, yeah, hell yeah, I want to write She-Hulk. And then they'd say, well, but we need a full script in a week. And I'd be like, but I'm in Norway and I already have a full schedule with many things due in this week. I can't possibly do that. Or, you know, and it was just that kind of thing over and over. And then when Domino came about, I had the time. It was a character I was really excited about, the movie and, and Zazie, yeah. or, you know, the posters of Zazie. And I was like, is it the Zazie version? And they're like, no, we can't. We don't have the license to do Zazie in a comic. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's probably true. Um, so I started researching Domino and and her character in the comics. I, I love her, but... It was kind of all over the place. She sometimes she was like Wolverine, sometimes she was a sex kitten, sometimes she was a sarcastic character with deep scars, and I just it was just felt kind of all over. And so I thought, okay, this will be kind of fun to try to bring that together and and figure out you know storyline. And then when um, Chris brought David and Abertov um, aboard, and I saw David's designs and Abertov's colors, I think that's the quickest then a whole entire art team ever gelled together for me. Mm. We were all so enthusiastic and happy and loved working together so much and, and want to get back to doing something together again as soon as possible. It just, you know, we, it's, it just happened that we just kind of fit. And that was really a super fun book to work on because of them. <laughs> well, and you kind of, I mean, obviously, cause you had not only, um, Domino, but you had uh, Outlaw and um, Diamondback. Am I right? Yep. Okay, cool. Because you know I'm, I am. I'm an idiot when it comes to a lot of <laughs> newer Marvel characters, newer, yeah. than Marvel, newer, yeah. newer that have been around for thirty years. <laughs> well, and I was looking for female characters that were different from each other that would kind of work together in this team, and I thought yeah. Diamondback would be the great contrast to Domino and and Outlaw. <laughs> well, and and you know, I mean, kind of your Marvel Birds of Prey, if you will. A little bit, yeah. You know. In a good way, honestly, because I mean, no, it was fun. And and seriously, like, just I, I mean, Domino's inner monologue, you know, was was great. And also, just like when she busted out and was in Shang Chi's robes and everything, it was <laughs> it was killing me. No, it was fantastic. Yeah, that was so much fun. Great, great book, man. And I I hope uh, I don't know. Would you would is it possible? Is the door open for a new arc? Um, I don't know. Not at this point, and things are sort of up in the air everywhere, you know, in publishing. And, um, yeah. you know, but I'm busier than ever, so I'm not complaining about that. It's just that, you know, the companies are trying to get get it back together, you know. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I know you you finished your five-issue run on uh, The Flash in a de decent yeah, that, that, that was, was another great. Book I, yeah, that was another book I'd been asked to write before, and I always said no because I didn't feel like, you know, I had much to offer, and I loved previous runs so much. But when they said, well, this is – going to be designed for new readers you can kind of take whatever you think is best about all the, the history of flash and put it in this one flash it's like Ooh, that cool. sounds amazing yeah. yeah so then i really got into it and i really got into reading a lot of the silver age flash and stuff like that and so um it ended up being just really a blast <laughs> 
No, I'm always up for a good Professor Zoom story. Absolutely. And, uh, and yeah, <laughs> yeah no, the Rogue's Gallery are the best. So you can't complain that, about that. Isn't that interesting? Totally. I mean, you know, really. I mean, the Batman Rogue's Gallery speaks for itself. But yeah, it is some, something about the Flash's Rogue's. They really yeah, do. they're just really fun, and it, I don't know. I was like, ooh, that's – when I realized I'd be writing Flash, like, ooh, I get to use the Groves Gallery. Yay. That's really cool. Amazing. Now, did you just start a run on uh, digital for birds, or was that a one-shot? It for was birds. a one-shot. Okay. Yeah. That was really cool. I'm not done with birds yet, but I can't talk about anything. Okay. That's cool. I understand. I think we can all read between the lines. That's excellent. <laughs> um, would you would you ever come back? Like, have you tried to come back to Secret Six, or are you done with those characters? How do you feel about if ever coming back to them? Um, I used to always feel like going backwards was not a good thing to do. However, um, lately I've been having a different mindset on that, uh, just because I start, you know, I start thinking of of stories that can be t more stories that can be told with those characters and, and in a different way. And so it's not out of the question. I think circumstances would have to be, you know, right for me and, and good in order to do it. But yeah, I, um, it's not much I wouldn't write again if I had the chance, I think. I missed, you know, I, I haven't had a chance to read uh, Wonder Woman 750. What can you tell me about your story for it? Oh, the with Star Blossom? Have you yeah. read, did you read the other one? Did you read the other Star Blossom story with Colleen Duran? No. Oh, okay. Tell me. So Star Blossom is a character that uh, we created that's a young black girl who has the power to um, uh, manifest flowers. And she she loves Wonder Woman and Wonder Woman. Um, and she kind of helps Wonder Woman out. And Wonder Woman is kind of a mentor to her. And I don't want to say too much because if people haven't read the story. Um but her character is, I just love her so much. And that is something I would definitely do a graphic novel of Star Wars. Oh, fun. For young readers, yeah. That's really cool. So did you and Colleen do the story for 750? Yes. Excellent. Yep. Oh, that's yeah. great, man. Well, I, yeah. I respect the hell out of both of you. So that's <laughs> She's amazing. She's amazing, yeah. If, if I was to do had the opportunity to do a Star Blossom graphic novel, I would only want to do it with Colleen. That's really cool. That'd be really great. Um, any, uh, and you don't have to specify, are there possible black label uh, stories in your future? Um, I have been approached. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's cool. Well, that's good to hear. So, I mean, you know, it would seem given your sense of humor and, and stories and stuff to be able to do a more adult book would like kind of be a natural in terms of progression and everything. So excellent. That's awesome. Um, what now I, I saw you, uh, you finished Catalyst, um, this year and, uh, the story for Lion Forge mm -hmm. and, and, um, okay. like, are you like, what, what is your status with Lion Forge? Forgive me. I'm not sure right now. That's okay. Okay. So, um, during the whole seven days and everything for the last two years, I've been, uh, their superhero guru charge of the, um, superhero universe along with an editorial team. That's fantastic. Cool. Um, uh, and we finished up the seven day storyline and the graphic novel. I'm not sure when the release date is now that quarantine, you know, quarantine and all that happened, sure. but sure. the graphic novel will be coming out um, at some point, hopefully soon. And um, now I am moving into writing some other things for them as well as possibly uh, helping develop IP and co-producing. Cool. That's kind of my position there at this time. And they are the, best group of people to work with and for and I'm so excited for all the different projects that I know about that might be coming their way um, and just really proud to be involved with them that's excellent are you creating original characters for them as well as uh, um, whatever I they have, have you know? done that in seven days I've created some original characters for the CPU um, and I am working on some stuff now it's always uh possibility and likely but what form that's going to take whether it's going to go into animation or something else um is a little bit up in the air right now and and what isn't up in the air i can't discuss <laughs> i understand um but it's it's a lovely place to be awesome. <laughs> that's cool do you like i mean because were you editor-in-chief or i mean you know no. I don't know. 
No. Okay. I was okay. never editor and, and editor. Um, that's not a desired position I want to be in. I was a creative director. Okay. Um, type thing. That's not to say that I don't, you know, go over things and see problems and, and um, you know, suggest solutions, but I'm not an editor. I'm not a good fit to be an editor. Um, so we had Shauna Gore and Desiree uh, are, were the editors for that I was working with the most on that. And they're both the best. <laughs> no. And I, I, sometimes when, you know, people take administrative jobs, it takes them away from their creativity. And I, you know, God, I mean, I, well, I some people can do both hats, just like some people can, can be an artist and a writer, you know, but um, I like to do the creative um, stuff, the overall the big picture story um, and make sure things fit and, and are easy for new readers to understand. And in the case of with Lion Forge and the CPU and those types of things that I like. And I did that at Dynamite too, where we did a couple crossovers, got different teams together. I like being like the creative director of a team, but um, I don't want to have to, I, I'm just no good at worrying about budgeting books, deadlines, you know, keeping people on the trains yeah. running like that. It's just not something that I'm good at. Um, and I, I know it. So let's let the people who are good at it do that. I hear you. I was, and I, I appreciate every one of them for it. <laughs> I had to teach or I didn't have to, but I was asked if I would teach for a semester and I kind of felt like an editor in terms of, you know, deadlines and things like that and getting mm -hmm. students to do it. And it's like, nah, this is not for me. You know, I'm glad I did it. I don't regret doing it. And I hope yeah. I helped some kids out and everything. But yeah, I just felt like I'd rather one-on-one -on -one help people and mentor them that way than, than oh, any sort like, of official teaching capacity myself. So. My sister works in an elementary school library. And so she's in charge of a lot of programs, um, reading programs, and also the learning about how to use a computer and things like that. And she is so excellent at that. And I am so would not be because she can be very organized and get a very simple plan together and follow the steps. I'm more like my head is full of stuff all the time and I've got to figure out how to, you know, weed through it, narrow it down, turn it into something other people can understand. And then while I'm doing that, I've got this other thing going on, you know, maybe five other things going on at the same time. And that's kind of how my my creative brain works and her creative brain works way differently. And we are not suited to do each other's jobs. <laughs> <laughs> you know, mentioning libraries, that is my big fear of whatever happens during the pandemic and how we come out the other side, because... Uh, as I'm sure you know through your sister and just in general, I'm sure you've spoken at a lot of libraries. They're so important. And and they've really evolved from what they were when we were kids. And with technology right. and the ability to, you know, really be a more learning kind of thing. I, I I just I really do worry about their future because I have friends in the library profession and they've been telling me sadly how cutbacks and everything are happening. Yeah, I'm very worried about nearly everything that's to benefit people as a whole, you know what I mean? Because yeah. the trend right now is looking a lot like a lot of selfish cool people who um, want to take things away from people that aren't like them, meaning white, wealthy, whatever. Yeah. Um, and so these, these services going away that, that helped level the playing field for a lot of us. It's very terrifying, not just that we won't be able to go check out a book, but for me, like growing up, if I hadn't had a library, I don't know if I'd even still be here. I'm serious. Um, it took me out of an extremely dysfunctional family, you know, mentally out so that I could go somewhere else mentally. It provided, um, uh, intellectual stimulation that I wasn't getting at school. And even like our small town, the library was small and I ended up reading every book in it. But then I learned that they could order books <laughs> from other libraries yeah. and then I could read those. And, you know, that kept me going literally and kept me interested in life and, and, and learning and curiosity and all those things. And, you know, not everybody can buy a bunch of books on Kindle or, on Amazon or whatever. And, you know, it really affects the 
equal opportunities, I think. And, you know, I've always felt that this country should be about that and um, seeing that those kinds of things in danger is very scary to me. I agree. I'm just thinking about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, even not only the reading and stuff, but um, I mean, you know, my library public schools, well, certainly the public schools too, but even like technology and the way that the libraries have embraced technology and they can for free teach you how to record audio, record video and do it right. well. And, yeah, uh, you know, I know. I know. And, and I think as a country, you know, especially we have the ability to, you know, provide these things, why do we not want to? Why do we want to, you know, bail out billionaires and keep corporations going that are really just abusing the people they employ anyway, yeah. rather than doing something that's good for everyone? It's I'm with you. Really, really bothering me. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm definitely with you. Well, I know another light subject because, well, first of all, before I forget, I did mean to mention while we were discussing The Flash, Love seeing Ryan Choi back, and it was great seeing Barry and Ryan Choi uh, team up. That was terrific. Oh, yes. I love Ryan. I miss writing him so much. And and that's another character like Scandal Savage that I think the DCU needs. Um, so, yeah. in my opinion. So, hopefully, they'll keep him alive and keep him going. Well, he's on Legends, so that's always <laughs> a good sign, you know, yep. which is really cool. Um, yeah. So, all right, non-comic stuff, because, as you know, you and I have messaged back and forth. We're both <laughs> massive Monkey fans. Yes, the monkeys. Have you ever seen them live? I was going to tell you, I, I only saw Mike solo about five years ago. Okay. And I'm really glad I did because his his music really is interesting to me. Um, I have yeah. to say that I, I, I have that uh, one cable channel, AXS Access, and they show, right. they've been showing a few Mickey and Mike shows and things like that. I don't know if I'd oh, want to see them okay. now. Because yeah. I really did appreciate the Don Kirshner polish, but also I really do like their later albums when they had more musical control. Oh my gosh, the 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 one that came out, the Good Times album, um, I was blown away by me and Magdalena. That yes. is one of the best songs that's come out in years. It's so beautiful and written by the um, his name escapes me, but by the lead guy for Death Cab for Cutie, who I yep. also saw I saw perform. Live oh, too, but cool. Scott and I saw um, the monkeys in Seattle shortly after Davy Jones had passed, like about a year, I think, after he passed. And um, I had seen like Mickey Dolan's at our local casino performing solo and stuff, and he's great. I mean, he can still sing amazing and play amazing, but he's a little bit corny, you know, especially okay. for that audience. You know, I think it's designed for that casino you know, audience, but um, the musical chops were still there. But when we saw them in Seattle, the three of them, um, that Las Vegas style gear show was absolutely absent. They were there to kick ass musically and it was amazing. And, and I was, you know, we were loving it and I was totally loving it. I kind of came to the monkeys later. It wasn't like I grew up with them, but okay. I came to them later. Just, we didn't have television and all that stuff growing up. So I just didn't, you know, I came to Batman late too, kind of. Interesting. Okay. So, um, but I looked around at the audience and that audience had people who were much older than us sure. and people who were much younger, young couples, all knowing the words, dancing, uh, teenagers that were there with their parents, but they weren't, they didn't appear to look like they'd been drugged there. <laughs> they looked forward to be really enjoying it and seeing the words and stuff. And they had everyone just having the best time and they were just so talented musically and that's the thing like you're talking about the production and all that but when you see what they can really do um together musically it's very powerful and the fact that they're not in the rock and roll hall of fame is just freaking ridiculous it's ridiculous it really know? is um and i also saw um peter tork and mickey dolan sing together um yeah. almost a cappella actually uh, Mike Nesmith wasn't there, and of course, Davy had passed on, but um, it was incredible. Um, the harmonies, everything, I just was like, wow, these guys just, they haven't lost it. In fact, they may have, you know, really improved musically since back when they were doing their show and such. Well, uh, and, yeah, uh, that was a great experience. <laughs> so when you saw the three of them without Davey, were they performing that uh, album Headquarters? Was that that tour? 
Um, wow, oh, that that escapes me. I'm not really sure. Okay, they were doing all, almost all their own music and definitely all their own vocals. But I'm not sure. sure they were doing a lot of obscure stuff too. So um, I'm not sure if that was that exact tour. I have to Google it and see yes. if I was there yeah. at that time. But it was it was the year after Davy passed. Over. Gotcha. Well, I'll tell you, and I, I kind of teased it to you, and I also want to put it out there because I want people to know about this. Um, a good friend of mine used to write for a rock magazine called Goldmine. And uh, about 10 years ago, he did a series of interviews, including all the monkeys. They were all still alive. And Chip Douglas, their producer, and Bobby Hart, who, as you know, Boyce and Hart wrote a lot of their songs and was very important. But, you know, so, yeah. um, And it was funny because um, he did them on a micro cassette. He did them never intending to release the audio that they were a print product. And the sound quality is not great on some of these because he, he didn't only do the monkeys. He also did uh, people like Neil Sedaka and Herb Alpert and um, Ron Dante, the voice of the Archies. And I'm right. several members of the Wrecking Crew, the backup band that played on so many great hits of the 60s and, you know, 60s right. and 70s. Wow. Uh, yeah, really, really neat stuff. And I was listening to Gilbert Gottfried's podcast and they had Neil Sedaka on. And my friend had told me years ago that he had done these interviews. I'm like, do you still have the tapes? He's like, oh, yeah. I'm like, you know, really? oh wow, yeah. I'm like, uh, there's a podcast in there, man. And <laughs> yeah. so I'm listening to Gilbert Godfrey talk to Neil Sedaka, and they um, they're like, oh, we got to read your autobiography. And he said, you know, actually, five years after my autobiography, there was a great book about me that I would recommend even more. They interviewed me. They interviewed a lot of people around me. It's a better book, a better representation oh. of my life. In the first chapter, they quote my friend's article about Neil Sedaka. Oh, so, wow. I, so I took a photograph of the page <laughs> yeah, cool. and I texted him. I'm like, get off your ass and find those tapes. And he did. That's awesome. So I've got, I've, I've, I've been going through the monkey stuff right now. And um, the Davy one sounds great. And I, I know at the very least. And I mean, oh, wow. the, Mike, the Mike one's a little, cause he was soft spoken. And I'm yeah. the way my friend recorded it, he had a phone off the hook, put the micro cassette near the earpiece and then I went on another extension and asked questions. So it's like I said, yeah. some of the quality isn't isn't perfect. I've heard worse from an archival interview standpoint. So I'm okay with it, and I'm still going to help. And all I'm going to do is produce. I'm not going to. Yeah. Cool. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, it's I mean, kind of weird. Weird with me with music because it it is so much a part of my life now, and it influences my writing and my creativity and my mood and you know everything. Uh, now, but growing up, I really did not think I liked music. Um, I wow. tried to play a couple different instruments. Um, you know, my grandmother played the organ, which I hated, and um, <laughs> and my mom can't sing at all and has no musical talent at all. And so I was kind of surrounded just by. Although she did really like Tina Turner, Cher, and Elvis, which I got, I am down with that. But that's cool. That's cool. <laughs> but. Um, I just didn't really like it. And it was when I met Scott, my husband now, that, and he's a musician and he had, you know, and he worked in a record store. So he had tons of albums and, you know, the albums had the lyrics on them and I would listen to them with him and just be blown away by the storytelling and the mood and the emotion and, you know, uh, those types of things that we were getting from David Bowie and Peter Gabriel. And then when the new wave happened from split ends and just, you know, different, just lots of variety, the punk movement, everything. And um, I just didn't even know that existed because in my isolated world, it wasn't available. And so he bought me some albums early on and I played them to death and, and memorized all the lyrics and stuff. And I realized that I just hadn't heard my music. I hadn't heard what, I related to yet and because I'm such a word person and a verbal person in terms of that the just the music alone was not enough to capture my imagination like um some of the other stuff that Scott introduced me to so it's just weird to think that it's so much in my life now and it just wasn't until that point at all would you ever want to like write uh, songs with Scott and have him play the music and you write the words? I'm asking. <laughs> We've done a little bit, but I did write a My Little Pony song. So that, <laughs> that actually got into the episode and done by, you know, amazing singers and musicians. So I wow. actually 
have a songwriting credit. <laughs> I'm gonna have to find that episode. Which episode of the show was it? Um, it's the one called Between Dark and Dawn. Okay. And I it's like number thirteen of I can't remember what season. So I'm sorry. Oh, you <laughs> gave me the title. Head. That's enough. I'll find it. That's fantastic. <laughs> I got I got to tell you, and seriously, again, this the great thing about what I try to do here at Word Balloon is we'll get stories like that from creators. And I also will connect with creators when I hear something. And I, I am I correct in remembering this, that for your wedding to Scott, uh, the Roger Daltrey song, Without Your Love. Yes. You see? Okay, yeah. And, I'm, and also, George Harrison, You Are The One. The lovely. One. That's awesome. No, I mean, seriously, Without Your Love, when I first heard it, it hit me on the right autumn day, <laughs> just by myself in the car. And, and I, of all people, Roger Daltrey, who usually screams his his songs, his best <laughs> songs, and this very sweet little love ballad and everything, and it's from that awesome movie that he made, and I can't remember the name. Right. Of it. Well, and I had never even heard of the Who until I met Scott, and of course, with the rock opera Tommy and all you know Pete's lyrics and stuff, it was yeah, just yeah. like so fascinating to me to to see how you could tell a story with music and and lyrics like that. So, but yeah. But, we had an outdoor wedding. It was very sweet. Those were the songs that were played. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, you know, Sh Shelly and I, uh, Shelly Bond and I, have been bonding over uh, '80s new wave music. All oh, right, yeah. Because you know, we're we're we we were of the same era. I'll leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been a lot of fun. And yeah, we had actually we had China Clugs in Flores on, and we were all talking about our love of uh, '80s uh, MTV kind of era music and stuff. I've been right. Having. So. <laughs> Too funny. During that time, I was in the hair salon with it blaring all the time with it on repeat. Because you know how they did the loops all the time on MTV. Oh yeah, oh, man. So I I love it and hate it both. <laughs> <laughs> That's outstanding. Well, and also for good times, I love that the monkeys got. Uh, did Andy Partridge from XTC? Didn't he write a song or two or whatever for? Uh... I think they got some of the best songwriters on that um, yeah. album. I just was blown away. And I, and I, I think that the the um, guy from Fountains of Wayne produced that album too. Am I correct? Yeah. Yep. And I, we saw him live in, in Canada, in Toronto one year too, by accident. We just, I mean, we were in Toronto at a convention and they happened to be playing there. So we saw them then. And, you know, his work is so phenomenal. That was such a terrible loss. Yeah, Jesus, yeah, you're right about that. Yeah, and also uh, Gordy from uh, Tragically Hip uh, still bums me out. That just uh, my, you know, I worked uh, at the same time. I worked ten years at a sports talk station and a rock station. They were sister stations, and I did work for both. And man, the rock side, it was like living in a monkey's episode, where literally you would answer the door. And I, as I was telling Shelly, Brian Ferry back door Saturday night. Oh my God, Brian I, Ferry. Okay, that would I would have fainted. That would have killed me. <laughs> it was pretty cool, even for me, even as a cisgender so, uh, man. I'm like, okay, that's awesome. <laughs> it's so fun, too, now that, um, you know, I have an adult son, or we have an adult son, and he's a musician as well. And oh, great. Um, he likes a lot of the same things. And we one summer we went on this, what we called the, the Rocket Family Music Tour. And so we started out in Washington and saw Alice Cooper. And he was performing at a state fair on hay bales in the daylight. And I was like, this is going to be freaking weird, you know. But uh, it was amazing. The minute he walked on stage, you could not take your eyes off of him. You didn't notice the hay bales. You didn't <laughs> notice the cows mooing in the distance. I mean, nothing. And um, our son's a huge fan of Alice Cooper, too. And we saw Death Cab for Cutie at that same time and Weird Al. And oh, wow. so, um, and then now lately... Dakota's become a fan of Elton John and um, Stevie Wonder and things that, you know, because growing up, he was all about um, Japanese glam rock and stuff like that. And okay. So, yeah. Kind of kind of, which is cool too. But now yeah, he's yeah, come yeah. around to liking some of the stuff. So now that we're all in the, stuck in the house together, we have music we can play that's, that we all like. <laughs> that's excellent. No, that's fantastic. Seriously, yeah. it, that is great to be able to bond with your kid over music because it can get yeah. generational. I was even <laughs> making the observation that, you know, I still love my, my bands from the seventies and eighties. And I'm like, God, that was like my father back in the eighties, loving big band music that he grew up with. And it, oh, it right. you know, it's like good. It, poof, I'm like, all right. 
What are you gonna do? <laughs> you know? So well my man or my woman. <laughs> I'm so used to saying my man. <laughs> I mean that in the the nice familiar way. It was a pleasure, buddy. This is a great hang. And I thank you for doing it. Um, anything you can promote that we haven't discussed? Oh, my gosh. Well, I am still working on the um, Humblewood uh, comic book that ties into the B&D uh, oh, cool. uh, setting for Humblewood, which I'm really proud of those guys and what they've done because wow. they have created something magical, really. So I'm working on that. Um and, oh, my gosh, a lot of stuff I have going on I absolutely cannot talk about. Okay. Are yeah, you... he knows I just finished Blast. Scott's yelling stuff in the background. <laughs> what did he say? Um, he said, you just finished the Flash run. I'm like, yes, yes, indeed. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, now I lost my train of thought. Um, oh, and I got an offer yesterday. I haven't accepted it yet, but it's kind of mind-blowing. Cool. You know, so as things become able to talk about, I will throw that out there and let people know what's going on with me. Excellent. But uh, busier than ever, so lots of stuff coming up. Did they rope you into a San Diego panel at all? Uh, I don't know. Scott takes care of that, and he hasn't mentioned anything yet. Oh, so. okay. Because I know they're pre-recording a lot of stuff, so yeah. I would imagine that, you know, I don't know how much they're doing live that week. I, yeah, I don't know either. I'm not sure what's going on. I'm you know, I'm keeping the interviews a little bit limited just because I have a lot of work. And it's like between all the Zoom calls with editors and phone calls and interviews, it can eat into, you know, all the time. So that's why I just do the special ones like yours. Ah, oh, buddy. Seriously, that's it means a lot. And honestly, I, I know. And that's why I try not to ask you uh, yearly or whatever, or, you know, <laughs> twice a year, always, like, it's some creators. Always, it's always good to talk to you. I love talking to people that are as excited about comics and life as me. <laughs> well, it's always all the best and uh, best to Scott. And uh, hopefully I will see you at a convention. Um, and uh, yeah, no, it's, you're, you're, as always, Gail, you're kicking ass and taking names. And I'm glad <laughs> you are you so because much. it's always a pleasure to read this stuff. So yeah, thanks for hanging out. Thank you so much, John. Good to see you again. Thanks again for watching another Word Balloon video. We've got plenty more at our channel, Word Balloon. If you enjoyed it, please like it and consider subscribing to the channel. And of course, support me on Patreon, patreon.com slash Word Balloon. Thanks a lot for watching.